So if you open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, verse uh, 15. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We're so thankful that you have sent King Jesus into this world to redeem us, to restore us to God that we have hope in you. Sometimes it seems that in this world um, there is no hope, but you speak clearly into this generation. You speak clearly into the kingdom of this world, that Jesus is God, that he is our Savior, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead, and that is the hope that we have. Amen. So, as, as a caveat, I was, I was about halfway through preparing this message, and and I realized that I don't have an intro, and then, and then as I got like a page through, I'm like, this doesn't sound very Christmassy either. And I was like, oh man, what's gonna, how's this gonna go? I had a, a short panic, and it, it kind of made me think of, of my wife, Jen, who sometimes I, I explain things and I get there, and, and she'll say, you got to the right end, but there's a much easier path to get there. It's, it's like, sometimes like when we're driving, and I, it's like, okay, Dan's taking the scenic route. It's like, you're wasting gas, Dan. I know, but I like trees, and I like to see stuff, and, you know, I don't know, I don't, I, well, whatever. So let's, uh, let's dive in here. So we will get there. So um, in Scripture, there's, there's a distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Ephesians 2 tells us, that this world is ruled by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Usually when we think of Satan, we have images of like gargoyles or goblins with horns. And Andy, being a medievalist, he could probably tell you, and I think that this is correct, that um, some of the Im imagery of Satan that we have comes from the, from the me medievals and their depictions of him were meant to make fun of him. They're meant to mock him and destroy his pride. And they kind of put it at, at, at the Gothic cathedrals and stuff as sort of meant to, to make fun of him. But then we moderns took these depictions as actual representations of who the devil is. And we've caricatured him as this really scary guy. But is that what the Bible says of him who God has temporarily allowed to rule the kingdom of man? No. Paul says that Satan is dressed in garments of light. So he is meant to appear good in order to lure you into his traps. He is, by definition, a deceiver. In other words, Satan isn't going to come down the street looking like Jason with a mask and a chainsaw, and everyone is like, there's the bad guy. That wouldn't go well, because if that happened to me, that's, you're not going to get me to go quicker to Jesus than if you do that. It's not how he does things. And so I want to dive a little deeper into the kingdom of man. Because just as you can't truly understand Christ's gospel without a thorough understanding of your sin, the kingdom of God is best understood against what our world has to offer. My emphasis here is on the evil one's power of deception and the others making grand promises that can't be kept. And there's much more things you could say. I'm just going with those two. So I wanted to actually look into what, what would a person who's explicitly a follower of the devil, if they were to say that, what do they believe? And what are their core tenets? And I, I read this, and I've, I've thought about this before, and it kind of bothered me. This is off the, the Church of Satan website, if you care. Our position is to be self-centered, with ourselves being the most important person, the God, of our subjective universe. So we are sometimes said to worship ourselves. Satan to us is a symbol of pride, liberty, and individualism. 
and it serves as an external metaphorical projection of our highest personal potential. We do not believe in Satan as a person or a being. The thing is, I could have just gave them the first couple chapters of Genesis and, and told them this. But, I mean, that's, that was sort of my, my funny thing when I was reading it. I was like, geez, this, you know, this is what it is. Um, but it also kind of made me lament a lot. Um, because in the West, I'll just say in the, in the West, if you were to ask the average Joe what he believes, he probably is not going to say that he's a follower of Satan. I don't think you're going to get that. But to one degree or another, you will hear the buzzwords of individualism, liberation, do whatever makes you feel good as long as you don't hurt anybody. The world is subjective. The Bible and our God is open to interpretation. Cliches that the world is taught to believe. These are half-truths, some of them not true at all, that are meant to cast dispersions on the truth, which has been revealed in Jesus Christ. The world is marked by a spirit of skepticism, which leads it to say, because God can't be known, then we will make ourselves God, and no one can pass judgment. And doesn't the world wrap this gift of individualism, liberty, and pride in the most beautiful wrapping paper of diversity, progress, and a better life. It is deceptive as it promises that through liberation of any kind of authority, we can achieve peace. But instead, what do we see? We see increased division, confusion. The foundations seem to be shaking from right underneath us. It makes me think of, you know, I'll stand in the line of, of Andy and Stephen of referencing uh, the line in the Witch and Wardrobe or, or C.S. Lewis, so I'll go with that, of uh, Edmund and uh, the, the Turkish delight that the witch offers him, right? Uh, and I believe when she gives it to him, she even said, you know, do they give this to you back home? And she's sort of, she's saying, this is really good and you don't get this and it's tempting him and luring him in and he takes it. And then you see throughout the rest of the story how it just it enslaves him. And he doesn't get what he wants. What he looks good actually destroys him. And that is how Satan functions. And for the Christian, it, it can be, when we're, when we're seeing this and we're dealing with this, um, it can be tempting to listen to the social commentators. Tell us what is wrong with the world and how to fix it. Better schools, more education, anger management, more taxes, less taxes, more government, less government. And, and for me, and this is where my pride comes in, is there's a desire that when you're told that Christianity is stupid, okay, well, I have to then make it more intellectual, intellectually appealing. And the more I try to do that, the more it doesn't work, but I still try. There's, there's nothing wrong with thinking through what you believe we should, but I'm also becoming more okay with looking dumb in the midst of it. It seems the, the, secularization, of, the secularization of our culture has created a, a billion dollar self-help industry. And it is enticing just enough to make the sinner believe that they can find rest in anywhere but in God. And into this mass of confusion comes our text. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. That word trumpet there is loaded with significance within Scripture. My, my concern is less with whether it is a literal trumpet or not, but what it signifies. The trumpet reflects the clarity and clearness of God's word as it enters in the clamoring and philosophizing of this world. It rightly divides truth from error. Where the world sows discord, the word sows peace. 
Where the kingdom of man brings confusion, the word of God becomes a lamp to our feet. As the world encourages doubt and skepticism, Scripture brings assurance. As the world accuses, the word of God wraps us like a warm blanket and comforts our souls. As sin was brought into the world through the first Adam, so through the second Adam will come peace, justice, and righteousness. The word does this because it, by its very nature, it comes from a God who is eternal. He is reigning and he is unchanging. Whereas the world is fickle, it's constantly changing. It comes, it goes. It likes you and then it doesn't like you. You trust it and then all of a sudden it turns its back on you. It can't give the eternal peace that only Christ can. All of the brokenness that is emblematic of the kingdom of man will be restored by the kingdom of Christ. But if God is perfect and holy, and his word is perfect and holy, and we are stained with sin, then how is the kingdom of God made known to us? Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit to remove our hearts of stone that we might taste and see that the Lord is good. Without him, we could not understand the great plan of salvation that is laid before us in Scripture. The Holy Spirit acts inseparably, inseparably from the Father and the Son. So the triune God makes his abode in our hearts, killing the evil deeds of our flesh and breathing life into our souls by lifting us up by the power of his word that we might overcome the powers of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The, the world can nuance, distinguish, clamor, philosophize, condemn, criticize, but at the trumpet sound, all mouths will be shut. And Christ will claim victory. Knowing that the Lord God Almighty has stepped down from his throne, crashed into the chaos of this world to bring about the salvation of his people, brings such a sweet assurance to the troubled soul. And who then, by the power of the Holy Spirit, inspired writers to bring us jewels from heaven in the written word and preserved it for thousands of years to comfort the church in times of trial. It is, it is not our abilities, our intellect, or reason, or the magisterium, but the Holy Ghost that gives us wisdom, discernment, and clarity in the midst of the clamoring of this world. It is him who prepares and makes us ready to hear the trumpet blast creating within us not just increased understanding, but a joyful anticipation when Christ will come to consummate his heavenly reign. The king we worship doesn't just speak with clarity, but he also makes promises that he keeps. We're going to look at two passages. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will raise up a righteous branch for David, he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will become saved and Israel will dwell secure, securely. This is the name he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Jeremiah, living 500 years before Christ's birth, who had fierce opposition to his ministry as he lamented over his generation's unwillingness to repent and turn to the Lord, yet he was not without hope. He was clinging to the promises that one would come, who is not just righteousness, but our righteousness. Christ belongs to the servants of the king. Yes, he purchased us with a price, but as much as we belong to him, he belongs to us. And as the Holy Spirit 
who before all things began, God the Father planned out that Christ would come to save sinners such as ourselves. Just as Jeremiah hearkens back to David to say that one better than him is coming to rule his people with justice and righteousness, so we have the benefit of being able to look back to Christ's death and resurrection and a sure guarantee that he will come again to right all wrongs, to crush the head of the serpent, to rule with boundless joy. And think of all the saints between the time of Jeremiah and then all of the saints from Jesus until now. Think of how these same promises of the reign of the king encourage their souls to fight the good fight, to persevere to the end, because the eternal king would preserve them by his grace. The same promise they relied on is the same promise that we anchor ourselves to. But for now, we wait patiently when we can worship our Lord together with all the saints, past, present, and future. As Jeremiah is, is promised Christ's coming, Luke gives us the keeping of that promise. We read in Luke chapter 1, verse 30 and 33. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom forever will have no end. Just as God spoke to Jeremiah to remind him of his faithfulness in the midst of the hard-heartedness of the world, so too Mary was told of God's faithfulness to conceive a son before the consummation of her marriage with Joseph. I could only imagine the feelings of anxiousness, terror, and wonder in how this made her feel. Throughout Scripture, the Lord has a pattern of blasting into our life like a trumpet, revealing himself clearly to his people in their greatest moments of vulnerability, just like he does with Mary and Jeremiah. I, I can't tell you whether he's going to promise you a, a promotion. I, I can't tell you whether um, all of a sudden things in your family are going to get better or, or worse. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you, you know, if you're young, how life is going to go with you as you're anxiously trying to figure things out. But Christ does speak clearly that he gives us rest and that you can cling to that in the midst of your struggle and the things that you're going through. He reminds his people that his reign is eternal, never ending. And so the rest that accompanies his rule provides a consolation to the weary Christian. As the world makes promises that it can't deliver on, Christ makes promises that he keeps and that are clear because the Holy Spirit illuminates the hearts of the church to receive the righteousness that is in Christ. So what now? The text is revealing the kingdom of God to come at the end of all things. But we know that Jesus says in Mark, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So we have the familiar motif of God reigning now in a particular sense, but reigning in a more perfect sense when he comes to inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth. I have found the, the now not yet motif to be very helpful in thinking about the kingdom of God. This past Christmas, um, it was a mix of both. Uh, I, I see the kingdom of man, I see the kingdom of God. You know, there's some really good moments that's like, and it's like, man, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, good moments with the family, the reading of scripture. But then there's some other moments that it was like, that was a blunder and that went way <laughs> completely off the walls. And you're like, yeah, it's just not quite yet. There's something missing. And so uh, the sin that happens that we, that we feel that we engage with, it, it's hard when you're going through it, but it is a gift 
from God because it shows us, it shows the sinner their need of Christ, that there's something greater still yet to come, that our family gatherings, that our fellowships that we have, um, that when we come together to worship God, yes, we are saved, we are redeemed, but there's still something missing that Christ will come to consummate at the end. So we are in this in-between phase of Christ's resurrection and his second coming. In terms of practical Christian living, I, I have a few thoughts in light of the eternal king reigning over his kingdom and how we are to engage the world as pilgrims passing through, waiting for our Lord to return. We read about the trumpet blast and other depictions of the boldness with which the apostles and Jesus speak in the scriptures. And we want to mimic that. And we should. But we should use discernment in the battles we choose and in the manner in which we articulate what it means to be bold. Remember, Jesus is king. We are not king. We are servants of the king. We are heralding his coming. Sometimes we can function more as helicopter moms, for lack of a better word. If you are a helicopter mom, I apologize. I don't mean to offend. Um, but it, it's bold, but sometimes you go in there and you're, you're just fighting everything, you know? And you're finding the boogeyman in every particular issue, and it, it, it's bold, and sometimes I, I admire that. I wish I could do that. But then sometimes it can come across, it can also be a bit reckless at times as well. But just like any sort of where we can go off the path, we can also go off the path on the other end. And this is where I have to confront my own struggles. Because as much as Christ calls us to proclaim the gospel, to live the Christian life, there can also be a spirit of timidity that comes with that, a spirit of passivity. I don't think I'm the only one in this church that struggles with that. I get that feeling. Um, I find that uh, sometimes we focus more on the fighting for the gospel and less on the resting in the gospel, which is why I, I find in terms of um, cultural engagement, resting in Christ is a, a better basis to start from. Because if we're not careful, we wind up mixing law and gospel or conflating the kingdom of God with the kingdom of man and we muddy the waters, we add things that aren't there, that we shouldn't that our citizenship is in heaven it's Jesus that is king and for guys like me I, we're called to go out there but on the other end of the spectrum Uh, I found comfort, I guess, with, uh, from Paul when he writes to Timothy that, um, uh, what's the, the verse, that uh, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but one of um, a sound mind of faith and uh, courage. And I rest in that, that we all have different personalities. God has called us in different ways to live in the kingdom of God. Uh, according to those personalities, some of us are going to be a little more bold, some not. And that we're going to mess up. We're going to fail at things. We're going to make parenting mistakes. Um, I'm not going to meet the deadlines at work sometimes, and sometimes I don't. But Jesus is enough. And so I'll close with this. With respect to the book of Revelation and the scenes of the trumpet and the, the loud voices, it, it makes me think of um, uh, after our first tour in Iraq, we came back stateside and we were, they were giving out like awards and there was a, a particular ceremony where the whole bat battalion is gathered together and the battalion's about like a thousand people about um, and we're all gathered outside and the battalion commander and the first sergeant there is oh, giving out awards for um, things done in battle that we just got back from. And once it was called to attention, 
the company first started, it's like a it's like a bolt of lightning bellowing through the air. Like everything stops. And he begins to read off all of what the individual did to earn his medal, his courage. And it, it, it gave me this sense of uh, goosebumps. Um, and it, it made me think of, as he's reading off the plaque and, and the scroll, and he's, he's telling of the awards that this individual earned, that how awesome to think that after the trumpet blast and the Lamb's Book of Life is opened, and to each of his people, God will read aloud with all the pleasure and delight that our Heavenly Father does. He will read aloud the works of his bride, whom Christ freely saved by grace. We get the benefits of Christ's work. And so my encouragement is to keep staying faithful, as Christ will always be faithful in preserving his people. Let's pray.